It's an indisputable fact. Insurance rates are rising. They are surging, according to NPR. Listen, if you've gotten your new updated bill or your new renewal notices for your car, for your home, you probably noticed 11, 20, 30. I've heard even double. Some people have a double the rate. So we're talking about 11%, 20%, 30% increases. Some people are paying 100% increases in their insurance premiums. What is happening? Why is this happening? And more importantly, is insurance even helping you anymore? Of course, I complained earlier on Michigan daily earlier in the year about my insurance fight with Liberty Mutual. I'm glad that that is now settled. I will disclose and recap that story and talk about how they went from offering $4,000 for my repairs. I was able to get $28,000 in my repairs. I'll explain to you how I did it all next on Mission Daily. We're going to dive into personal property insurance and why this industry is screwed. <laughs> everybody it's your boy big al mission daily stephanie postals is not with us today she is on spring break with her kids or i guess her kids have spring break and she's going to spend time with them whatever okay mom but i'm happy today because my insurance situation is finally settled at the top of the show i talked about how insurance prices are surging at the same time they're seemingly doing less to protect you the customer so it's a big question of what are we even paying for, but we'll dive into that. Let's recap really quick for you so you can catch up and understand why am I even so hot on this topic to begin with, and I'm going to talk about my townhome. If you remember last year, my townhome started seeing leaking water. It was random leaking water that we could not figure out what it was. My insurance company said, hey, listen, you are insured for water, but only from the plumbing. So you have to prove it's from the plumbing in order to be covered. So we're talking about hiring plumbers, hiring leak detection companies. Multiple companies came to my, my house to figure this out. And every single time, it was defined as not a plumbing issue. And because they couldn't figure out the source of water, they dubbed it groundwater, which was a colossal mistake on my part for allowing that to happen. And I'll disclose why in just a moment. So this is what happened. I now have intermittently leaking water. I don't have a source of water. I have no insurance to cover it. Meanwhile, my walls are starting to warp. My floors are starting to warp. And everyone is telling me the only solution is extremely expensive. I mean, I'm talking about I'm getting quotes into the 40s of thou 40 plus thousand dollars to fix a townhome that only has 400 square foot on the first floor where all the damage is occurring. Nobody knows what's wrong. So I decide to make a to invest my own dollars into ripping the floor out if I or pull some of the floor out. And when I say ripping the floor out, that's again, a mistake I had because that's how I talk. When dealing with insurance, you do not want to talk in absolute numbers. And I will disclose that in just a moment too. So we pull out a little strip of wood along the warp line to see what's causing it. The warping of the wood makes it seem as though there's a straight pipe that's going through my floors causing the problem. Pull up the wood in this very narrow spot. I should have measured it. I didn't measure it at the time. And it turns out there's nothing there. There's some minor cracks in the cement, uh, but there is no pipe there. Okay, so they're saying there only can be one thing, and that's groundwater, except the water is inconsistent. So you would think if it's groundwater that when it rains, you would see water come up. And in Maine this past year, past summer specifically, there was a ton of water, ton of rain, but water never leaked into my unit when it rained. It was like intermittent. It was random. So no one could figure it out. Well, fast forward on September 23rd, water starts gushing into my unit. My tenants calls me and we immediately say, hey, uh, you know, we immediately get someone to go look at it the next day. Unfortunately, I couldn't get emergency plumbing services. It was a Saturday night. The next day, water is still coming into my unit. We cannot figure this out. The plumber immediately looks and says, this has to be coming. It's not a plumber, excuse me. The contractor immediately looks and says, this has to be coming from the next door neighbor. We have to be able to open that door. HOA president is on my side now and they said, okay, let's, we have to get authorization to open this door to figure out what's going on. Turns out it was the water tank in the other unit. It just so happened to break on the 23rd. It was leaking prior to the 23rd, but it was leaking. Interestingly, it broke at the top. Like there was, it started cracking at the top of the water heater. So we had guesses as to, you know, maybe it's during the outline. So as water was used for the shower, it would pull out the top. 
and every now and then it would leak on the floor causing some random wetness but since it wasn't done enough I, we don't know the answer why it only appeared every now and then but it only appeared every now and then that is the water so now i have a solution i think okay it's my neighbor's water tank that's been shut off it gets fixed and the very next day so this is monday september 25th on monday september 25th i get a phone call from my neighbor's insurance company shout out state farm that says hey this is our fault we're taking liability and at that moment i'm thinking great i now have an answer to my problem i understand where all the water's been coming from we can fix it i can fix my floors this is no problem i was wrong very very wrong on september 27th three days now or four days depending on four days after the, the initial pipe burst on the so let's recap on 9 23 the water tank officially breaks on 924, I've I've identified for the first time. I've properly identified for the first time that it is my neighbor's water tank. On 924, also, I submit the claim with my insurance company, Liberty Mutual, who I'm about to smash throughout this entire episode because they sucked. On 924, I submit a claim to Liberty Mutual through their online portal. I can't get an agent on the phone. Their online portal says you are to mitigate water damage immediately. So mitigation means you should stop it you got to dry it and you should fix it because water damage is going to be, it, it's like exponentially worse. The longer it goes, the more damage there is. On Liberty Mutual's website, they have multiple listings of service providers that they recommend. So I call all of them. None of them are able to come in any reasonable time. So I just had my contractor that I you always use start the job. All the while, I'm thinking this is great. I'm finally covered and protected because we know the source of water. It's not from the ground. It is from plumbing. It's from my neighbor's plumbing. Like, this is great. 925, the Monday, State Farm calls me and says, it's their fault. Okay, even better. Liberty Mutual, my insurance company, doesn't show up until 927. On 927, by the time 927 had rolled around, I've now called my own contractors. We've now removed the wood flooring completely because it was old wood flooring. And you got to remember it. The tank broke on the 23rd. It basically got more than 12 hours of water all over it um, and it damaged it. On 927, the insurance adjuster finally shows up. Her name is Melissa Compton. I'm calling her out. She was nice, but not helpful. She comes to my unit. She takes pictures. Doesn't really say much, shows me the report and moves on. Okay. So then she says, I have to finish up my report and I'll, I'll tell you the next steps. Sounds good. On 927, I'm informed that they, meaning Liberty Mutual, will not be representing me and that I have to file a formal claim with my HOA's insurance because they are the primary, they're the primary insurer. And only when my HOA's insurance declines me, will Liberty Mutual, my secondary insurer, will they take over the case? At this point, there's nothing left to do. Liberty Mutual says, we're not the insurer. I'm like, well, I don't know what I pay you for. Uh, but they say, we're not the insurer and we can't help you. Uh, so good luck. So now I'm like, okay, this, this, is just, this is just some paperwork, the clerical work we gotta do. So on nine, so that day, I ask my HOA to file a claim for me. They go to file the claim, but here's the problem. Do you remember how I said people had been investigating my property for a time period before to figure out where the water was coming from? Their insurance also deemed it groundwater without ever inspecting any of their units. They deemed it groundwater. So they, all they wrote is denial due to groundwater. I take that piece of paper. I show it to Liberty Mutual. Liberty Mutual says, yeah, but that's from before. This has got to be a denial based on water tank. So they're making me go back and forth with the HOA's insurance over who's in charge. Meanwhile, I'm still paying out of pocket to get this fixed myself. And this is where things get really you know, you can feel bad for me, but you should, you should recognize the problem with the system for yourself. The problem with this system is the burden of financial responsibility falls on the victim. I'm the victim in this case. My neighbor's water tank broke. 
Their insurance company has already said it's their fault. I'm the victim, meaning the water's leaked into my unit through no fault of my own. So I have all the repairs. I also have a tenant in place, which I then move to an Airbnb during the majority of the repairs because I also have loss of use insurance. I'm thinking I got loss of use. That's in my policy. My tenant can't stay here. This is all covered. I'm just thinking this is all covered the entire time. The reason why this is so important is because what your policy covers you for is actually not what you are going to be covered for. It's insane. Okay. So here I am getting it fixed, dealing with paperwork. It's annoying, but at least I think it can get done. I feel like this is just bureaucracy at its finest. I'm frustrated, but I'm also lucky because I'm financially independent or I have enough financial means that I can cover the cost for now. And I think I'm going to get reimbursed later. I'm just assuming I'm going to get reimbursed. <clears throat> By the time October 17th rolls around. So now we're talking about 24 days more, or excuse me, 20. Yeah. It's more than that. The, it was from uh, the 23rd is when the water started leaking. So then that's seven days on top of now the 17 days. Yes. 24 days, 24 days after the incident, I finally have a letter that says my HOA is not in charge. Okay. So the HOA insurance is not in charge. So I send it to Liberty Mutual thinking, okay, now, now you might be thinking, why are you doing this? If State Farm is the one that says they're taking liability, why are you even dealing with all this paperwork? The whole reason why you have insurance is because when something bad happens to you is they have your back. Think the money situation is the big thing right now, because in an ideal situation, your, your insurance We'll take care of you, meaning something bad happens to you. They guesstimate that the total cost is going to be $30,000. They give you the $30,000 to fix everything up. They then go, it's called subrogation. They go subrogate with the other insurance company for the amount so that no one's, so they're not out the money. That's the whole point. So when I got hit by a drunk driver, for example, in 2017, my insurance company bought me a new car immediately. They then went and got their money from the other person's insurance. So that's the process. It's called subrogation. Why that matters is, is in this situation, if I couldn't fix the unit, I would have suffered more damage. If I couldn't fix the unit, my tenant would be out of a place to live. So it was all on me to fix it. Luckily, it wasn't a problem. But you could imagine if you were in this situation, like uh, you're listening here and maybe you have a lot of bills or you need the rental income to supplement your living, you would be out completely and you would be at the mercy of the process. So I handle this and Liberty Mutual is now involved. It's now 1017. Well, they immediately have all types of requests that I wasn't prepared for. They wanted photos with metadata. On the 20, between the 23rd, they demanded it be between the 23rd and the 27th when they came to see it. In their position, because when they came, remember that website on 924, when I went to Liberty Mutual to file that claim, their website said, you must, or you recommend, we highly encourage you to start mitigation immediately. So I did that. So the walls, if you follow the rules of insurance, how they handle uh, wet drywall, they call it a flood cut. And that's 24 inches above the flood line. So wherever the water comes in, go up 24 inches. They cut right down the, like basically a parallel to the floor. They cut all that wood out or drywall out. So Liberty Mutual says, because when we came to inspect it on 927, there were no floors and there was no, like a lot of the walls have been cut out. They said they weren't going to cover those things because there was no evidence there was any. I was like, what do you mean there was no evidence there was any? They said, you can't provide any information that says that material existed. And therefore, if it didn't exist, we're not insuring it. This was like their position. They would not cover me for this. They would only cover me for the cabinets because the cabinets hadn't been removed and they were soaking wet. So I'm thinking they're like, what are you talking about? I talked to my contractor. Unfortunately, all their pictures were from before the flood. The contractors, the reason why I had contractors on call was because of the groundwater misdiagnosis from Liberty Mutual prior. 
they had already come and taken a look at all the place. They took pictures, took video. They took the flooring. Uh, they, re they were the ones who removed some of the flooring. Now, I, now I'm saying some, because before I talked in absolutes, remember I said I talked in absolutes? I said, remove the floor. Well, that's how I also typed up my claim. In Liberty Mutual said, I said that the floor was removed. They said that they were assuming all of the floor. So they were saying that I was saying that all the floor was removing, as in there was no wood flooring uh, present at the time of flood, and therefore it wasn't covered. That was one of their positions. Their other position was there were no walls when they showed up, so there must not have been walls. So unless I could prove that there was any type of flooring present and or walls present from 923, excuse me, 924, because I didn't make the claim till 924, from 924 to 927, they wouldn't cover any of it. They valued the total damages into my unit at 4,800. They also would not cover the loss of use because they did said basically there's no clear evidence that the person had to move out. You should see my photos of repair and be like, oh, okay. They wouldn't cover the loss of use. So here I am having insurance thinking all this stuff's going to get covered. I have a person and party that believes that they're liable. And I have my own insurance who usually would cover the costs up front and then they go subrogate with the other insurance company. So now... It's over a month. Everything's repaired. I got all my final invoices and I'm being told nothing. Basically, nothing is covered but the cabinets. The lower cabinets are covered. There's a $4,800 valuation they put on it. They want, I have a $2,500 deductible in my policy. So they said they'll offer me a, um, a $2,300 check for thirty, almost $35,000 in damages. That's what I got offered. So I immediately hire an attorney and I try to figure out like what is going on. And under Maine law, here's what's interesting. Under Maine law, <laughs> it says in absence of uh, photographic or video evidence, testimonial evidence should suffice. And I had testimonial evidence from my contractors, the HOA president, and uh, my tenant, as well as the other insurance adjusters who also got called to this case to represent the HOA that all saw that the flooring, the wood, the, the walls, everything was present. And my attorney basically told Liberty Mutual, like, this is required by Maine law to be admissible as evidence. And they said, yeah, it's admissible in the court of law. However, we are not accepting it. And therefore, unless you choose to litigate, we're not recognizing it. So they basically said, unless you sue us, we're not going to accept that as evidence. Well, now I'm, I'm talking to my attorney, like, what am I supposed to do here? And they said, hey, there is a possibility you could lose. Meaning if I sue Liberty Mutual, my insurance company, who supposed to be representing me, they're still, you still might not win. So they would not have to pay anything. And if you did win, you got to pay me. And I did like my attorney for just being straight up with me and being like, hey, listen, you're, the idea that you're probably going to make money on this is so low, um, I don't recommend it. So he was just straight up with me. If I, He's like, if you go forward and sue Liberty Mutual, you're, um, you're SOL. So I just made the decision to... Um, to deal directly with State Farm. All the repairs had been in. I had finally had enough of going back and forth with Liberty Mutual. I fully recognized they had no intention representing me in any sort of, in any, any way or shape or fashion. They would not accept so much evidence that I submitted. They would not accept any of it because they said the metadata didn't, didn't say it was from those dates. So um, a great example is when you have data. So if I send you a photo and you download it from your phone, your computer is going to say it was downloaded that day. It doesn't actually tell you when the the data the actual file was made and so we couldn't and my contractors weren't like that burst in technology some of them had photos some of them didn't i couldn't ever pull together enough evidence that said yes with metadata from 924 to 927 i had uh floors present so i sucked it up and i said to my attorney hey listen i'm gonna go straight to state farm whatever they offer me i'll just accept and I'm just going to hope for the best. And the only thing I can do is redact my claim. So Liberty Mutual did not settle my claim. And all I can do is share with the world that Liberty Mutual sucks ass, never purchase insurance with them. 
even me and my business partner have nine properties between us. I per, I'll never use Liberty. Me. I would never even consider using them. When I needed them, they did not represent me in any single way. They definitely collected my check, um, but they didn't represent me in any single way. So I went and I said, fine, redact the claim, pull back the claim, rescind the claim, cancel the claim, went to State Farm. State Farm actually was really quick about it. In less than two weeks, they said, we value your claim at $28,000. Now I spent close to thirty five. I didn't have enough energy left to go back and forth anymore. I said, yes, thank you. Thank you for helping me. And that's that. So what did I learn during that process? Number one, your insurance company is not representing you in any shape or fashion. They are not there. They make money. Well, specifically Liberty Mutual. How they make money, we all sometimes forget, is they they collect premiums and they don't pay. That's their goal. So you got to know that. All right. But here's what I did. Here are some tips I have so that you can better fight. The first thing I'd say is always keep emergency funds on hand. Uh, if you're relying on your insurance to pay you immediately. So for example, if I was desperate for money, I probably would have said yes to that $4,800 right out the gate because I was desperate for money. If I was desperate for money and I needed it, I could have said yes to that and that's it. And then they would have gone and subrogated with State Farm for 4,800 bucks. I would have been reimbursed my deductible later on, but $2,300 check is what I would have gotten. And they'd be like, good luck fixing everything. All right, the next thing. Here's some other more tangible lessons when you're making claims. Number one, do not accept lack of evidence as uh, lack of evidence. Basically, just don't accept it. If there's lack of evidence, there's no conclusion. So my biggest mistake was allowing, one of the big mistakes was allowing Liberty Mutual in the summer to even claim it was groundwater. I should have never accepted that. I should have just been like, it's not, but well, you can't prove it's groundwater. So why don't dub it groundwater? The reason is groundwater is not covered by most, most people don't know this. Is groundwater is not covered by most homeowners insurance. You actually need flood. Flood insurance is separate from your homeowner's insurance. So by them saying it's groundwater, now that was on the record. I had to always prove it wasn't groundwater because once they've deemed it something that is not covered, they would just say it's not covered. So that was a big mistake. Lack of evidence does not equal conclusion, all right? So we couldn't prove where the water was. Therefore, there should have been no conclusion. That's what I should have forced it as, like inconclusive. I could have accepted that, done more testing later on, but I should have never said, okay, it must be groundwater because there was no evidence it was groundwater. There was just no evidence it was from my building, from my unit. That's all the evidence they had. They did not actually know where the water was from. So do not accept lack of evidence. Number two. Everything must be in absolutes or ex exact measurements. Don't allow the words all or never to enter your vocabulary, all, none. Don't allow it to enter the vocabulary. Don't let it even be assumed. Insurance companies by default jump to, like if you say you removed flooring, they'll say you removed all the flooring. They never think to themselves, oh, you removed two by 20, you know, two inches by 23 inches. So if you have material removed, if you have damages identified, if you have an area you're observing, you should bust out your tape measure and measure that and de declare with photographic evidence how big or how small something is prior to any type of mitigation, fixing, repair, anything. Everything must be measured. If you are remote, like I was in this case, because I live in North Carolina, Talk to contractors who promise to measure and send photographic evidence in order for you to pay them. I would tie it to pay. For, so I'm not asking for a discount. What I'm saying is I can't pay full price for your repair unless you do this for me. That was a big mistake of mine because that way, at least when they send it to you, like if I send it, if, I, my, if I'm a contract, if my contractor had sent me those photos with the tape measure out on those dates and I uploaded it to cloud, that would show metadata. I collected it as late as this moment in time. So definitely always photographic evidence, definitely exact measurements, never allow absolutes to enter the equation. Also do not lack, do not accept lack of evidence as a conclusion. If there's a conclusion, there must be evidence to prove the conclusion. Otherwise you will be in a forever problem of saying, the, the cause of an issue is something else. 
The next thing, do not accept a lowball subrogation. Okay. So when your insurance company comes to you and offers you whatever amount, what they are saying is they are saying, this is all the evidence we confidently feel that we can co uh, have collected. This is all that we confidently feel we can get from the other insurance company with the least amount of effort possible. The reality is insurance companies don't want to be fighting, bickering back and forth as to what claims and what amounts are being settled. So I think they have like unwritten rules that say like, hey, if you provide this, we re re uh, reimburse that. If you don't provide this, we don't reimburse that. So they have their rules. So you're just a cog in their machine. So a lowball subrogation offer does not mean that's what your repair is worth. But if you accept it, it's very hard to then go back to the liable insurance company and say there were more damages that were not covered. So if you can, if you feel like your subrogation package is super low, don't accept it. Just be like, no. And that's going to be on you to decide. Having that first thing, which I talked about, which is having enough funds to repair things on your own makes it easier to then decline a subrogation package. If you're desperate for money, you're desperate for a new car, you're desperate for your house to be repaired, you just won't have that option. You'll be screwed, all right? The next thing, I, final thing I'd like to say is um, definitely get trusted advice. Want to give a big shout out to my business par partner, Mike Caggiano. Mike uh, does, he's the one that got me into uh, Section Eight, the Section 8 business. And he was just a, I would say a, a bunch of knowledge to kind of walk you, th walk me through the process of how I should handle and treat things. I also have a good friend named Travis Edmonds. He works with Williams Realty. He's a construction project manager. He was able to quickly, when I was to tell him quotes in the repair, he was very able to quickly be like, that sounds too much. That sounds too high. He always, he didn't know the exact pricing of anything, but he always could kind of ballpark what it would take to fix something like that. He couldn't tell me the exact price because he's not in Maine. Um, but he was a huge help too, for me to not get screwed over by contractors and possibly overbilled to the point where none of that would have been reimbursed. Cause that is also a problem. If you are fixing or choosing your own repair company and they overfix it, that won't be covered either. What's going to be covered is what your insurance company values something at. And that's it. So those are my major tips and what I learned in my ordeal. It sucked, but if you're out there listening and you have secondary properties or things like that, these are these are these are points that I think invaluable, invaluable. Like if something bad were to happen, and again, this is not your fault. Like your neighbor does something to you, a tree falls on your property. I don't know. It's like something else happens. This is invaluable. Um, I think I saw recently a uh, a car, like for example, that drove into a retail store uh, in in uh, in my city. So that. The situation would then apply. the the retail the car driver's insurance is the liable party. The <laughs> insured is the business. The business is going to fix their place as fast as possible because as long as they allow this process to play out, they're out of business. So they would have to get it fixed as soon as possible, which means they would have to go subrogate. So it happens more than you'd think. And what's happening right now with the insurance companies? Back to the top of the show, surging rates. We had talked about in other episodes. I think insurance, as we know, it's gonna, it's fundamentally gonna change. So what's happening right now is insurance costs keep rising for car and home. It's because the cost to repair has gotten ridiculously high. So if you think about the price of cars, they've gone up. The cost to repair cars has gone up. The total damage cars get in each accident has gone up. So everything's getting more expensive. These costs get divided by just about the same number of drivers, right? Our population really isn't growing that much. So there's nowhere to go, but the prices of your insurance to go up. I, th I see in the future, the insurance costs are unavoidable, right? It's required by law. But in the future, what's going to happen is insurance is going to become such a bulk. It's basically going to be like a tax. It's like a tax on ownership. I think everyone's going to have to look really hard in the mirror and be like, do I really want to own these things? Is this what's going to drive down the price of cars, drive down the price of houses? Because people no longer want to own expensive ones. Until we as a population stop buying the things, the makers of the things won't stop making them. So it's a bigger discussion to see like what would potentially happen. I don't see a place where federal law is going to change this because uh, if federal law forces people, forces the insurance companies to insure properties at full value, what they'll do is they'll look for more ways to not pay. 
It's the only way. If they were to and cap and cap their rates. So imagine federal law says insurance companies have to insure full value of any piece of property and they cannot adjust their rates. Then what you'll have is like what's happening to the postal service. You're going to have losses everywhere, just constant losses by the insurance companies who I guess would get reimbursed by the federal government. But anyways, the only way they'll make money is if they don't pay. So this will become a bigger problem. It's not going to be a smaller problem, especially in the next five years. So if you're out there listening, get your stuff in order, build that fund that is going to protect you in the event something does happen. You are going to save whatever you, th I think 30 grand is a decent number right now. The bigger your house, the more you got to save and have on hand. Um, it's a painful reality. It's one we're all facing, but I'm glad I got through it. And uh, so you can learn from me. These are all the mistakes that I made that made it really, really hard. Um, had I done those things that I mentioned, it would have been really easy. Tell me what you think. If you've had a similar claim, talk about it. Info at mission.org. Look forward to hearing from you. In the meantime, protect yourselves, save that money, and buy cheaper stuff. That's basically it. That's the only advice I have that I know can tangibly help you in the in the uh, in the next five years. Until next time, Mission Daily. Mission Daily.